afternoon and welcome to universe, our UKZN's um, teaching and um, technology enhanced learning uh, channel. Uh, today we are very um, honored to have two professors who will be talking on the decolonization project, particularly in maths and science. Uh, in the recent past, South Africa has been racked by lots of student protests who have been demanding uh, the taking down of colonial uh, statues and artifacts uh, that are in universities and also a change of the curriculum so that it represents a more decolonized content which is more relevant and appropriate for the youth in the 21st century which recognizes their historical contribution but also enables them to accept their identity in a decolonized space. So uh, welcome to both of you and thank you for accepting this invitation. Um, I'm going to ask you both to just introduce yourselves, your affiliations and the work you are engaged in at present. Well, I'm CK Raju. I am an honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Education based at Mumbai and also a professor emeritus at the SGT University in Delhi. And currently I am doing decolonized courses on quad geometry for schools and calculus without limits at the university level and also history and philosophy of science at the university level. Hi, I'm Kesh Govinda. I'm a professor of applied mathematics here at the University of Pozulu Natal. I'm also an adjunct faculty at the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences. I teach both at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level, and in fact at the moment I'm teaching second year students, and I engage in research around Lie group theory ap and applications to differential equations uh, that arise in mathematical physics and mathematical biology. And I'm Naina Amin, an associate professor in the School of Education, and my field of expertise is curriculum studies. So as part of the higher education conference, CK Raju has been invited to deliver a keynote address on decolonizing mathematics and science. So I want to start off with you, Kesh, that in a field traditionally seen as non-decolonizable, <laughs> would you like to share some thoughts on um, decolonizing the maths and science curriculum? Okay, let me just take a step back first, okay. because um, I just want to talk about nomenclature for a second, right. if you'd allow me to. So, the term decolonization is really very trendy and um, you place this in the context of the um, protests that we've had throughout South Africa. Um, but I want to take this back a little bit further because I think the reason we have all these protests and the reason we talk about decolonization is because we really have failed to transform higher education in particular, but South Africa in, in general. And I think the problem we've had is that we've taken a, a very mechanistic approach to transformation and we have not properly engaged with transformation. Um, so if we had properly engaged with this, we, transformation of the curriculum is supposed to be part of our transformation, but that's something that we've not fully engaged in. And I think that is what has largely led to the, the protests we had. It's a failure of us in higher education to really grapple and, and engage with transformation. Um, having said that, um, I do know that there have been attempts to, tra to transform the curriculum um, in, in various uh, sectors, not, al al not always very successfully. And I think part of the challenges we face is that, firstly, all of us teach the way we've been taught. And we've all come from a colonial background. And that is the biggest challenge that we face. Uh, a lot of us in, um, in my colleagues, my academic colleagues will not like me saying this, but a lot of us teach in, acad in academia with no training at all with regards to the way we should be teaching. It's just, we just employed as, as good researchers and we expect it to teach. And as a result, we don't necessarily critically engage with not only the content of what we're teaching, but the manner in which we're teaching. And that I think is what, one of the big problems we have. We're just too focused on just continuing what we've always been done. And that's where the challenges uh, okay, arise. So there are two points that I'm going to pick up for our conversation, starting the first one with, do you see transformation as decolonization? No, it is a euphemism, very clearly a euphemism, which should be changed. If we are doing decolonization, let us at least be prepared to use the right word for it. 
if you are afraid to say the word, I mean it is like some kind of uh, you know four letter word or it is not four letters, a big word, so which, which you do not want to <laughs> say. So, why should it be like that? If you are so ashamed of it at the outset, won't do. Have to change it. What is your second question? Okay. Well, just yeah, sure. It is not a question of being ashamed because in South Africa, we have we only recently started using the term decolonization and I am sure internationally it has been used a lot more, but in South Africa in particular, um, our narrative has been around transformation and the point I am trying to make is that decolonization is an extension of that. So, we supposed to have been doing this already and we have failed in doing this. That is the point I am making. But uh, I was asked a question by students at UCT a couple of years ago, you know, what is your take on decolonization? And after a few minutes I said, listen, let us not get too caught up in our nomenclature. You may call it decolonization, I want to call it transformation, it does not really matter. The point is there is still work to be done and we should get around and do it. Okay. So, of course, in, in discourse uh, theory, uh, the, the way you speak about a thing mm -hmm. uh, gives it a kind of reality which then enables you to, to act on it in a certain way. So, I want to come back to the idea that if uh, transformation in the South African context has really been to, um, to undo the legacies of the past in terms of social justice and so on. So it might have meant access to education um, and so on. But I think decolonization is much more than that. Would you like to elaborate on what that might mean? Yes, because certainly. India comes from a similar, we've both been colonized by similar Absolutely. colonial powers. Absolutely. And I think that uh, when we are talking of decolonization, we are trying to undo the mischief that colonial education deliberately did. And mathematics and science, he did not mention anything about that, but I think that is very central because Macaulay said that uh, India needs, uh, I mean the colonized need uh, western education for the sake of science in which the west is immeasurably superior. So, I think that any decolonization process must start from there and must decolonize mathematics and science. Now, we have been working on this as part of multiversity for the last 10 years or more and that is something that I was talking last week in uh, University of Cape Town and uh, it is uh, really amazing to see the academics just running away from debate. And I think that if we are going to talk about this, at the very least, we need to have debate. It is not the existing academic community which is going to decide uh, that, uh, you know, without any discourse, without any debate on what path it wants to take. Because they would, as he said, just want to stick on to do what they always did. Now, I too was trained as a formal mathematician and for uh, seven years, more than that, I taught uh, formal mathematics you know, real analysis, functional analysis and so on at the university. And then when I shifted to this uh, supercomputing project and I started working on real life applications, I said this is worth nothing what I learnt. I did a PhD on that, then I taught for so many years, I said I have learnt nothing. I am not able to do anything. That is when the whole process of transformation started. And that is one part of it. Then of course, there are other parts of it that there was a false history of science which came along with it which tells us that you must look up to the colonized, they did everything. So, certainly Newton did not invent the calculus. I have a fat book on that pointing out how the calculus developed in India, how it was uh, uh, taken, stolen by Jesuits who took it to Europe and then they did not understand it. That is the critical part, that not only is it copied, it was not properly understood. And that happens with everything, you know, zero we are talking about. So, the very word zero comes from zifr or cifr or cipher which means a mysterious code. So, because the I mean Europeans used Roman arithmetic, they were arithmetically challenged and they did not understand zero. He said you put it, it has no value in itself and it adds any amount of value to the preceding number. That cannot happen with Roman numerals. You, they are additive, not a place value system and so Florence passed a law against zero. So, people do not understand and this is just the simplest example. Same thing happened with calculus and if you change calculus, you change science. So, this is very much possible, but we need to have a debate on it, a public debate on it, which is why I went to UCT. There was a panel discussion, but nobody engaged and the students are now saying, you told us to engage, you are not engaging. 
Okay. So can we come to some uh, understanding that transformation is a subset, say, of the decolonization project? Would, uh, Kesh, do you want to say something around that? I don't want mm -hmm. to get too caught up in the terminology because I think it's more how we interpret things. Okay. For me, transformation, uh, as CK would appreciate, is, is change. In its broadest terms, transformation is change, right? And so if you're talking about change, it, it's a very broad concept and decolonization would be part of that. But I think because of our histories, we looked at these terms very differently and as a result, we, we interpret them differently. But as mathematicians, the first thing we do in our papers is we write down a definition. And based on the definition, we then develop our entire theory. So let's just define that what we're talking about here is critical change okay, to engage with our curriculum to ensure that, quite frankly, that we're better teachers. I mean, isn't that ultimately what, we, what we're doing here? Right? We want to be better teachers. We want to teach properly and correctly. I think that is really what, what so, we're trying to do. So, of course, now we, we, we kind of have a, a, a kind of a binary <laughs> in which uh, decolonization becomes a subset of transformation and oh, the, the other way around. Yeah. And, of course, it, yes, mm -hmm. so yeah. take it up. He's taking a very mathematical view of transformation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, a formal mathematical view of transformation, how it is defined. Now, I think that if you look at the specific features of decolonization, I think we need to look at that and not just talk about transformation in general. Because transformation in general could mean so many things. But decolonization means something specific. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what we need to enter into because our education system as it stands, the colonial education system happens to be church education. It started off as church mm -hmm. education. If you look at Cambridge, if you look at Oxford, look at Bologna, look at Paris, they all started off as church institutions. So if we are talking about decolonization, we have to engage with those specifics and not merely a broad view of transformation in general. That's why I'm insisting that we should use the word decolonization, not merely problem. transformation. Yeah? Really yeah. So yeah. it appears then that to decolonize mathematics and science would require a fundamental paradigmatic shift. So it means a sort of removing or kind of leaving your background as a mathematician and perhaps to delve more into philosophy and much more into the history of the systems of thinking and thought and the way knowledge is produced and generated and who gets credit for it. Uh, well, that is not all. Well, I mean, you have to engage with the history. You have to engage with the philosophy. But more than that, you are engaging with the practice. So the practice of mathematics before formal mathematics, formal mathematics started in the 20th century with Hilbert and Russell. But before that, there was another mathematics that prevailed right from the days of the Rhine papyrus. And why don't we declare that to be universal? So the idea that only a particular kind of mathematics which developed in the 20th century ought to be universal is a normative idea. It's an imposition. That's the first part. The second part is that this formal mathematics, this formalism is something which is an add-on. It adds on a whole lot of metaphysics. Metaphysics, let me be very blunt, is fantasy. So it adds on a metaphysics of infinity, a particular view of infinity onto everything that is done, onto 1 plus 1 equal to 2. If I want to explain why 1 plus 1 equal to 2, I must refer to Piano's axioms or I must refer to set theory and that applies to an infinity. If I want to refer to a geometric point, then I must say that this point is infinitesimally small. There are infinity of points in a line, infinity of lines in a plane. So everywhere you have this fantasy of infinity coming in, which then has to be thrown out if you want to decolonize, because it has no practical implications whatsoever. If I am making a calculation, if I am sending a rocket to the moon, I will work with a computer which cannot engage with metaphysics of infinity. So I will use a floating point arithmetic. Or if I am doing the calculations by hand, I may use some other kind of arithmetic, but I never encounter infinity. So this is an uh, issue of, uh, I mean, this is an issue which needs to be addressed. And then if you do that, if you look at the way calculus developed in India, you have, for example, non-Archimedean arithmetic being used to some infinite series. Or you have numerical solution of differential equations, that's how it starts. Or if you look at the way geometry was done in India, you look at chord geometry, which is the way it was done in Egypt. 
So, if you go back to that, that has a tremendous advantage. You know, if you look at the compass box, the compass box has no instrument with which to measure a curved line. Now, how do you even define a notion of an angle? They said two straight lines. That's completely wrong. Uh, angle is uh, the way it developed is a relative length of the arc of a circle. And for to be able to measure the arc of the circle, you need something which can measure a curved line. There is no such instrument in the compass box. So, you need to have a string or cord and that is how uh, geometry was done in Egypt, the practical aspect of geometry. There was also a mystery geometry which worked differently. So, uh, you look at that and you look at similarly the way calculus developed. Now, if I am looking at numerical solution of ordinary differential equations, I can solve every practical problem I need for ordinary differential equations from Newtonian physics or of partial differential equations, it does not matter. The philosophy is a bit different. I am not trying to prove the existence and uniqueness of solutions, right. What I am trying to do is I am trying to calculate. So, there may be situations where you cannot calculate, for the, I mean, where you cannot prove. For example, classic example which I gave 20 years ago is stochastic differential equations driven by Levy motion. You cannot prove the existence and uniqueness of solutions. You can only work with Brownian motion. But this problem may arise in the stock market where you can apply it, where you can make meaningful calculations and lead to practical value. So, the idea is if you do it that way, it becomes very easy and it makes science better because the kind of metaphysics that Newton put into calculus, fluxions, time flows, which is of no value, not only is it of no value, it is of anti value because in Newton's, in Newton's second law of motion, you have a d by dt and in order to make sense of that d by dt, he made time metaphysical and because he made time metaphysical, the calculus, I mean his Newtonian physics failed. It failed precisely on that point that you are unable to measure time. You do not have a physical measure of time because if I am doing physics, I need a physical measure of time, not some properties of God, you know, some metaphysics time flows on like this. That is all wrong. Okay. So, now we are really getting into the nitty yeah, gritties so which cuts me kind of <laughs> out. So, I am going to rely on you, Kesh, to mm -hmm. kind of either agree, counter or provide an alternative. Sure. So, I think um, before we started yeah. the, this session, um, Sika, you mentioned that we should be critically engaging. Absolutely. And, and, and while I can see that you're doing that, there's also certain generalizations that you're introducing that I don't necessarily agree with. Okay. For example, infinity having no place. And maybe infinity I'm missing having? having no place. No, no, I didn't say it has no place. It's mm -hmm. not finitist, it's mm -hmm. not empirical, that's a common caricature. I say it's a different conception of infinity. Okay. For example, I said non Archimedean arithmetic to be very precise. Mm -hmm. That non Archimedean arithmetic of Brahmagup was used to some geometric series by Neil Kant. So, I did not say infinity has no place, I just said there can be multiple concepts of infinity, the Western concept is not the only one. Oh, and, and absolutely, and, yes. and there is yes. no, no question about that. I think yes. one has a number of different concepts. Uh, yes. uh, I do not think I will be as, maybe it is because I do, have not really uh, uh, researched this yes. Yes. Uh, as much as you have, mm -hmm. but I would not. Um, call some of the concepts metaphysical because for me they have a, metaphysical has a particular context that I really have no place for. So, uh, while I still think that there is a number of um, aspects of mathematics that we can still use even though they may have a colonial, colonial uh, background and they may seem metaphysical. And I think infinity that you mentioned is one very interesting thing that one can use if you start thinking about black holes and things like that. No, where no, there's no, black holes are mm -hmm. another imaginary thing. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's not get into black holes. That's <laughs> far out. That's general relativity. Lots of people will dismiss the existence of black holes. Let's stick but to the calculus. Lots of people will also teach. accept them. So no, no. How? What basis? You see, it has mm -hmm. to be refutable and so on. There's mm -hmm. no way to refute their existence. They have not seen a black hole. Can't see one. Let's leave black holes out of the discussion. Okay. Let's mm -hmm. talk of calculus the way it is taught at okay. the level of the university. Okay. You teach it with limits. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Now, what is this limit? Most of the students have no concept because in order to teach them limits, you must first teach them real numbers. So, they do not learn real numbers except at uh, maybe a postgraduate level or an advanced undergraduate level. In order to teach them real numbers, you must first teach them set theory. They do not learn formal set theory. In fact, most expert mathematicians also do not learn formal mm -hmm. set theory. Correct. They work with knife set theory. Right now, you have you are teaching something which is impossible to teach, and the students go away with completely confused concepts. If you ask them what is the limit, you ask them what is the exponential function, they will say, "All right, I mean, what's the derivative of the exponential function?" Very easy. Derivative of exponential function is itself. Ask them what is the exponential function? Oh, it's this infinite series, you know. And then say, "What is meant by an infinite sum?" They don't know. What is meant by a real number? 
they don't know. Just now, for example, in this course, I set a question paper mm -hmm. asking all these questions. They cannot define limit, they cannot define derivative, they cannot define integral, they cannot define anything. And they have some confused notions of tangent. Tangent is visual intuition. And it is wrong visual intuition because they think a tangent is a line which meets the curve at one point, mm -hmm. which is completely wrong. It's a purely local notion. Where it meets the curve elsewhere is uh, irrelevant. So, uh, these kinds of problems they have and instead of that, what I teach them as a decolonized course is that uh, calculus is, this, is the numerical study of differential equations with a philosophy of approximation called zeroism. So, you are not looking at exactitude. Exactitude is a fantasy, exactitude is an error according to zeroism or shunyavad as it is called and there is a whole big philosophy of that. For example, you are not exact. You were one Kesh who came in and now you are another, you have participated in this discussion, you have breathed in, you have breathed out, the molecules in your body have changed, right? You are not the same. Sure. But that difference I ignore, I neglect because uh -huh. it is not relevant to the context. Correct. So, the same way you have to have a philosophy of approximation and that philosophy of approximation is what I call zeroism. And you can work with that for all practical purposes. You do not need the exactitude. So, that exactitude is what is wrong. That exactitude is a fantasy which is problematic. So, I asked my students to write down the exact value of square root of 2. How can they write it now? Yes, right. It is not uh -huh. possible. Uh -huh. So, uh, then they understand that this exactitude is only a fantasy, a metaphysical fantasy. That is my problem. That you work with, uh, now in the Shurva Sutra for example, square root of 2 is called Savishesh, something uh -huh. with an avshesh with a remainder. Uh -huh. And that is the philosophy which prevailed elsewhere. That you are doing something, you leave out a remainder, but it does not have to be uh, exact. It has to be, it has to suit your purpose. If I want to send a rocket to the moon, I have a circular error probable. That is good enough. I am not going to make it land on one invisible point. Mm -hmm. So, that is the idea. That is a practical philosophy and it makes math very easy. It makes calculus very easy. So, they define exponential function now as the solution of y prime equal to y subject to y 0 equal to 1. And they can solve it and they can see the solution and they are very happy. They can define, see there are so many misunderstandings, trigonometry. So, sine function. They think of the sine function, you ask them to define, they will say opposite side upon hypotenuse. Mm -hmm. It is not about triangles, it is about circles. So, Kish, yes. is, is that not what we do at present? Mm. Uh, so, this, uh, in, uh, you know, to make students aware that it is not exact. So, I mean, there is a limited amount that you can do with students. I mean, they have a very packed curriculum and trying to expose those nuances isn't always possible. Okay. Uh, for example, I'm teaching, and it's ironic that we mentioned numerics, because at the moment I'm teaching a, a course in numerical methods to my students. And indeed, the points you're making are exactly the points that I make, where they have all, they, they know a lot of calculus, and they expect things to work mathematically, but they don't work computationally. And it, it's quite interesting to see how they grapple with that because they know that mathematically this is all supposed to be working, but as soon as you deal with um, the finite precision of a computer, these things break down. But I can do that at a different level. I cannot do that in my first year calculus course because of, admittedly, the way it is currently being taught. Now, if we really want to make a real change, I think trying to throw everything out or trying to get people to actually change the way they, they teach is going to be quite difficult. I think we really need to look at the low-hanging fruit. What's the easy things that we can already implement uh, in our courses? And it may be something that is not complete decolonization, but even just looking at the content, at least attributing things to different people. And there's a process as a result that people can engage in and then appreciate exactly where different ideas come from, where different thoughts come from, and will then spur people to start looking at this. If I think about our new academics that are just coming in, they don't have time to engage with us. There's a lot of pressure on them to publish. They've got to produce their students. So to do that and engage with decolonization is, is really expecting a bit too much from them. And I think it's up to more senior academics okay, to really engage with this and try to present it to our a young academics in a more palatable form, a form that they can easily digest and easily impart to their students. And I think that is where we, s we, we have a way to go okay. to do that. So I want to pick up on uh -huh. the statement that you made earlier because I said there were two points. Uh -huh. yes. The one uh -huh. was about transformation and 
the relationship with the colonization, which we can't come to <laughs> in exact. <laughs> so we leave it as in exact at the moment. But the thing that you spoke about was our teaching approaches and mm -hmm. content. And so, of course, in educational theory, we've referred to as the PCK problem. Okay. That's the uh, pedagogical content knowledge. So the way we teach and what we teach. And I think what you were pushing for, um, and I might be wrong, and you may correct me, is more the approach, uh, the how we teach. Yes, and perhaps I think what decolonization is expecting us is to look at both, how we teach and what we teach. And well, think, uh, and it's, sorry. Okay. I think the easiest uh, thing for now? us to deal with is, is what we teach. I think it's more difficult to deal with how we teach. And I'm not sure that's given enough attention. In, in, in this whole decolonization debate, because it's very easy for people to think of the content and saying, well, you know, you're attributing calculus isn't to that Newton. that's what our students are fighting against. They're not happy with the content. And it seems to me that we're grappling with how to change the content. Is it fear of change? Oh. Yes, I think it is the academic, uh, as he said, to begin with, they're very right, that they teach what they learned. And then if you ask them to change, if you ask them to retrain, it is a big effort which they are not going to make mm -hmm. so very easily right. unless you push them to do it, right? But that has to be done. And by the way, I am very happy that your PCK has CK in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's many more. I mean, there's now TPEC and, and so forth. And it's also CPCK because people are now talking of context pedagogy, content, yeah. and knowledge. Uh, you I, know, agree. So. I, I, I agree with what he's saying, that yeah. you have to tell people that calculus originated elsewhere. But you see, the point is not, it wasn't the same calculus. It was a different calculus, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And this different calculus, you have to point out the difference. That when it was absorbed, it was absorbed keeping in mind Western culture. And that brought in certain negative features, according to me, like limits, uh, metaphysics of limits, and then in, uh, you have real numbers, in or, I mean, uh, in order to get limits, and then for real numbers, you must have set theory. It's a huge structure, which nobody, well, very few understand, extremely few people understand. How do you expect these students to understand it? So you have poured all this on them, whereas if you are doing this, which is an everyday matter, the students grasp it very easily. So it makes math easy. That's a very important mm -hmm. thing. And the second part, as I said, is that because of those concepts, you want d by dt to be perfect. Now, in zeroism, you regard that sort of perfection as erroneous. What you teach in numerical analysis courses is the computer is erroneous. What I would teach is that what you do in practice, what you do in reality is the truth. And what you fantasize about is erroneous. So that is exactly the Shunyavad position. Mm -hmm. That is the idealistic thing which is erroneous mm -hmm. and not the real thing. You deal with mm -hmm. the real mm -hmm. thing, right? So that's okay. the mm -hmm. other aspect and that makes a huge change because you don't have such a pileup of concepts in order to achieve this so-called perfection. And you are working with something very simple which students can grasp and you think of it. You see here what is happening? South Africa ends up at the bottom in terms of mathematics, right? Now why does that happen? Us. <laughs> now, why does that happen? Why does that happen? It is happening for a variety of reasons. I mean you can give, well, you can make all sorts of uh, claims that it is because the schools are bad and so on. But why isn't any blame being accepted by the universities? They should accept part of the blame because the university drives the downward curriculum. Absolutely. Always this is uh, right. it flows downwards. Mm -hmm. So you change it here, things will change there. You start teaching string geometry, people will understand it very quickly. So there won't be that sort of concept, but then you have to resist the international pressure, which says that, okay, you must do calculus like this, you must do things like this, you must do trigonometry like this, and you say, well, you don't want to do that, you break away. So that breakaway thing, that's decolonization because you're breaking away from the center and you're saying, that it's not the job of an academic just to publish. The job of academics is to serve the society around them. Why are they responsible only to their peers in the West? That's wrong. That's part of the colonization process. And that's one of the things you need to do to decolonize. Make them independent. Make them responsible to the society around them. Let the academics explain why the teaching of limits is important, how it helps the uh, uh, African student or the African society, which has no use for it completely. Whereas the numerical solution and so on will be useful for a variety of things. Or let us say if you are measuring with a string, you can actually measure the shape of an irregular field. You can calculate your latitude, longitude, you can calculate the size of the earth, which are all important things. 
So, you are able to do that and that I think becomes an important issue that you are disconnecting from the West, saying academics should not be controlled by the West, should be controlled by the society around you. That so becomes a very important break. That's why I say mm -hmm. decolonization, so, not merely transformation. Yeah. So, so maybe uh, part of the decolonization project is for people who teach in universities to be aware of alternatives. So how do we get this alternative science or the alternative histories to them? Because them. So, no, no. So remember, as Kesh was saying, we are the products of colonial education. Mm -hmm. So how then do we get conscientized? How then do we get access to this in order to, to bring about the changes? Because we have, it seems to me, we have to get decolonized first mm -hmm. before we can do the teaching of decolonized no, curriculum. No. If we do no. this chicken and egg story, we'll okay. never get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. okay. so we'll just be chasing our own tails forever. Now, what was suggested at UCT was that, all right, if you want to bring about a change, or what is being done at SGT University, that people are very reluctant to change. They are afraid to change. So you teach it as a parallel course. You teach it in addition. So you say, all right, we're not going to remove the existing way calculus is done. You do that introduce it as an additional course and let the students compare or let the students eventually choose. So that will make a very big difference. So let them take the existing thing and introduce something side by side because unless you introduce it into the curriculum, things are not going to change. We will keep talking about it forever. So Kesh, See, what the are the practical points? Mm -hmm. Now you are saying, I heard you say earlier that your curriculum is quite packed, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So. And so this is an interesting alternative yeah. to introduce an additional course. Okay. Um, and then, you know, maybe we can make place for it in the curriculum if we, if we really want to. But the question I'm going to have is then, who's going to do the teaching? Because yeah. if I look around, certainly in my school, if I want that, I mean, there is no, I mean, at the moment, there isn't even agreement on what we should be teaching our first years in the current Western Arts curriculum. To now introduce a new curriculum, which very few of us have any knowledge about, is going to cause a lot of difficulty. So the question is, who does this okay. and, and where does the development of this curriculum come okay. from? This is a very valid question. Now, the way it has been done, for example, at the school level. Now, I conducted an initial workshop, an initial workshop for the teachers because they are teaching both things. And at the school level, it's very difficult. The university mm -hmm. level, you have the freedom to design your own curriculum and so on, right. at least to some extent. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the school level, it's all controlled by the government. So you teach, uh, say, 40 teachers, and then they go and train others. So you have to create uh, awareness of that, and you have to create the uh, people to actually do the job, and you have to have textbooks. Now, the textbooks happen to be, well, almost ready, and so we would be able to do that. But it will take time, but we need to start. If we don't start, it will take an infinity of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, no, I understand that completely. So, mm -hmm. obviously, um, a part of this uh, re-education of higher education teachers uh, might be sort of a correction of history. Also, of, of course, very of important. Very important. That's what is there in my book, Ending Academic Imperialism, that since uh, Macaulay imposed colonial education using a false history of science, that we did everything, then to undo it, you need to challenge that history but it should not be limited to challenging history mm -hmm. because then people say, oh, that's marginal. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, you should get to the techniques, you should get to the calculus, you should get to the geometry, you should get to the trigonometry and algebra and so on and start explaining how it can be done differently. And calculus, I think, is most important because that is what is used for science. All mm -hmm. the equations yes. of physics are formulated as uh, ordinary or partial differential equations. And that's what you use. And so calculus is where that comes in. So, Akesh, uh, one of the problems we face, of course, is um, the control and power mm -hmm. uh, of the West over journals, where we publish, what mm -hmm. gets respected as knowledge and what does not. Um, should we be starting our own journals? Well, uh, we already for, have, we have done that. I mean, Could you been a tell us something? Well, so not specifically in this field, yeah, but yeah. I mean, the concept of having local journals is not foreign. I mean, this has gone on for quite a while, and the Academy of Sciences of South Africa 
has reviewed all the local journals in South Africa to ensure that the standard is at a, an appropriate level. So there's no problem with us introducing our own journals. No, so I'm talking case. of a journal that will deal specifically with transformation, decolonization, change in higher education and so on. Uh, but more specific to say mm. maths and science, you know, rather than just everything. Sure, I think there's definitely a place for that. You can have all sorts of interesting debates around, you know, what curriculum would be appropriate. You know, and, because and I think like we that. all mm -hmm. know a little bit that's different mm -hmm. uh, and that so this needs to be sort of much more of a shared project Absolutely. where we uh, exchange ideas mm -hmm. with each other, we feed each other and in a way it, it's a kind of a support as we go into the new terrain um, and, uh, uh, and so on. So certainly to me it also seems that um, who you are has something to do with it. Uh, may I uh, yes. come in here with a suggestion? Yeah. First of all, you see, publication should not be the aim. Secondly, if you are publishing, you, I mean, publication is good for debates and so on. It should not be secretively peer reviewed. Because the moment you introduce a secretive mechanism, that's a church system of pre censorship. The moment you introduce a secretive mechanism of censorship, that is not on, it can lead to all sorts of misuses and abuses. So you have post-publication peer review, you have peer review, but it is not secretive the person you, because today it does not cost anything. If you are producing a journal, you just put it online for example. So place the article first, place the review after that and uh, if something has to be rejected, give the person a chance to respond and place the response there. So you can still reject, but it should be transparent, you should know who has rejected and why. Otherwise, it becomes an exercise in power and that is used to maintain status quo. So we should not imitate mm -hmm. that Western practice of secretive review. After all, if you have a public discussion, what is wrong with the public discussion? It's so a good idea, isn't it, for yeah, science yeah. particularly? Yeah. Yeah, so we have, a, make, we have a lot. journal in South Africa called Pythagoras. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> and we, we're not telling you which Pythagoras it is. Uh, but I uh, published a paper because I write qualitatively about maths and science, so mm. not the specifics mm. about mm. it, mm. Uh, but really about narratives of of mathematics teachers and so on. Pythagoras is a mumpsimus. Yes. <laughs> so, but the, the way the peer review is done in this journal is that it's an open peer review. Mm -hmm. So you send your article in, mm -hmm. uh, it's reviewed, and then the reviewers are sent each other's reviews, yeah. you know, in which mm -hmm. you, you get sort of educated as to how uh, sort of cash reviewed mm -hmm. the paper and how you reviewed the paper. No, but so everyone then there's should a, be yeah. everyone should be made aware of it. Yeah. No, no, so, it, so it's also the author, mm -hmm. the reviewers and the editor, so then they can enter into a conversation around that mm -hmm. and then the decision is made. So that seems to be the halfway point to the close, the, um, what you call the double blind peer review mm -hmm. process. This is a, a little bit limited, open, but the one you are suggesting is the radical one in which it's you... Radical. Yes. Public discussion, you say, is radical, it should be... <laughs> no, in <laughs> what is radical? No, you radical in terms it, of the way it's, it's been done traditionally. Uh, well, you it's know? done traditionally in the West and it was done that way because church dogma cannot stand public debate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they said that before you publish it, and those days publication was important, you must censor it and make sure it's not going to upset the apple cart. But that's what decolonization is about. We want to upset the apple so, cart, right? So, so, so why then you need is to it have that? very possible that you could get some very spurious kinds of writing mm -hmm. that are online, and even though they are contested and, and so on, but they will still be there. What's wrong with that? What's wrong? Because you are saying, you are giving on your opinion that this is not valid for such, such, such reason. Is it For not example, the same as uh, the no, fake no, no. news that Trump produces? No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 because you are putting it with a comment. You are putting it with a comment. For example, somebody writes about C.K. Raju's mistake about Euclid. You know, I offered a prize, as you know, of 40,000 rand. And he quotes from all tertiary sources, Wikipedia, St. Andrews and so on. Now, I just put a one-line comment there that, look, this is about primary sources. Just look at the reference list, there is not a single primary source, matter over. All right, so that is enough <coughs> for any discerning person to make, because after all, these are 
going to an academic audience. Surely they should be able to apply their mind. Why do you want to guide them all the time? That's a problem. Guide them all the time and guide them using secrecy. Let them apply their minds. If there is something valuable, pick it up from there. If there is nothing valuable, reject it. You have provided the guidance and put it online. But don't force them. We won't show this. That is very problematic. For example, in terms of decolonization, my article on how to decolonize mathematics was taken down by the conversation. Now, once that is taken down, you are not exposing, you are not allowing people to see what is the argument being made. If they had some problem, they could state the problem in addition to it. So, Kesh, how will no? all of this work with our, um, what you call, performance units, <laughs> the recognition? <laughs> so, it seems to me everything is sort of deeply connected yes. mm -hmm. and trying to bring about change in, in one, one part affects another. Uh, yes. might mm -hmm. not affect the other, it might just affect the individual. <laughs> yes, and, and yeah. that's unfortunately often yeah. what happens when one is trying to make a positive change you're seen as the outlier and there's no uh, yes. accommodation uh, for this. Absolutely. I think the idea of having um, a journal or a discussion forum that is more open, that is more engaging, is a very interesting one. Um, I'd, and with the electronic world, we can definitely make we that happen. That's that. very, very easy to do and people you know, are connected now from most parts of the world. Uh, and so people can have more meaningful engagement to this than with journals, we have high page charges and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Um, but we have to be cautious about how much of this we do, because quite frankly, how, much, how many of us have the time to engage with that level of interaction in every area of our research? We don't. But I think this would be a good place to start, because I think this is an important place to start with decolonizing the yeah. curriculum. Yeah. And so if we can start either a website or a journal around this and, and, and really have engagement on this, I think it will be very, very useful. But very, very uh, useful. that should go hand in hand with some decolonized courses actually there, because unless you do that, you're not going to make a critical change. It will still be talk, talk, talk and no action. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to introduce, uh, maybe if there is something wrong, you work at it again and revise mm -hmm. it. Because we are saying the existing thing is wrong. So that course must come down, it must be, uh, uh, students must be exposed to it. And then alongside you do this. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Do you have any um, results to show how effective these uh, courses sure, are? Sure, 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 okay. sure. These are all published. Okay. These results are published because mm -hmm. the first experiment started in 2009. Okay. And mm -hmm. uh, that first experiment was not very successful. I mean, it worked with about 50% students. Mm -hmm. It was successful for them because they did not even have a background in eight standard. Oh, really? Okay. So that was tough. Mm -hmm. But then there were these four experiments that were done in University Science Malaysia with uh, undergraduate group, with a uh, uh, undergraduate group in pure math, undergraduate in applied math, postgraduate in math, and a non-math group. And those results are all published, and if you like, I can give them to you. The detail you want, the histograms and so on, they're all available. I think they'll be very useful because, yes. you know, I started off saying, you know, as academics, we tend to be resistant to change. But the greatest motivation for any academic is to be told, if you do this, you're going to improve the way your students learn. Any academic is going to so buy into that. Based. Yeah, it's evidence based. And so if we see this, people are going to be far more engaged with this because, after all, as I said earlier, we're here to teach our students and we want any way to teach them better. Oh, but this was published <coughs> long ago. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, what I find is that, for instance, in UCT, it's stonewalling. <coughs> Hmm. That we don't want to discuss, we know best, you convince us without mm -hmm. our dis without any discussion. You know, it's like you persuade astrologers that they are being superstitious and how do you persuade them? They will decide, <laughs> you know, and they will decide without a discussion. That's not on. But that's how the community functions because it's controlled by the West. Mm -hmm. Every, every uh, parameter of performance is just you publish in Western journals, well, that gives you something uh, plus value and so on and so forth. So all these parameters are controlled by the West. Uh, you cannot change the syllabus, but supposing the new syllabus were introduced by Harvard or Cambridge, you will introduce it overnight here, there won't even be a debate or a discussion. Mm -hmm. right? But we are working so hard and it takes, uh, it is so difficult to introduce. So the evidence is there, but the, there should be a willingness to discuss the evidence. Mm -hmm. After all, the whole point was I am going there, I am talking about it. So That's let's true. discuss it. The evidence is there, it was published in 2011. That's six years ago. So. Yes, I think uh, we got our freedom in 1994. Mm -hmm. yes. It's taken us 23 years to wake up, just like uh, in uh, 
which year did this uh, children, in 1976, mm -hmm. the children in Soweto rose up, conscientized the nation and started us back on the path to liberation. Students again took up mm -hmm. the cudgels yes. last year yes. and have reminded us about what we should be doing in this liberation phase. And so um, I think our work starts. So unlike uh, countries in the South, uh, South America and in India and uh, in, the, in the East, uh, where you have engaged and grappled with decolonization, we are really novices and mm -hmm. you can see how right. we grappling and battling. So before we end this, some final thoughts from you, Kesh, around decolonization um, and what you see in the future? Um, I think uh, decolonization is a, is a process that while maybe nascent, I, don't, I think it's inevitable. I think there's, there's an inevitability about it and the naysayers are not going to, to win over. Uh, I can see that we are making positive change and that it may not happen soon, it may not happen as quickly as we all may want, but ultimately I think we're on the right path. Some well, uh, I think one of the things, again I would repeat, is the absence of action. Now I agree with you that this process has been going on in India, in Malaysia and so on. Why isn't there any attempt to learn from it or to discuss it? No, at least put it on the discussion table and say this we don't like, this we reject or this we accept for this reason and so on. As you said, by all means evidence based. We are not doing it emotionally based. But at least discuss the evidence or try it out here and uh, bring out your own evidence. Right? So that needs to be done. You need to try and replicate at least the experiments that have been done earlier and that would give you something very solid to go on. You don't even have to trust what I did. I can show you all my answer sheets and so on. I've kept them, I've preserved them. But irrespective of that, right, you can uh, replicate it. That's the best way to do an experiment, replicate it. So there should be no fear of doing that. No? That is very important because that fear, there's a great fear. The moment you touch something, the whole thing will fall apart, which it will. <laughs> but, you, but you need to do that, right? Okay. So while the fear factor has been really strong, I think in us for many years, we've grappled with so many things in this country, um, and our minds have been captured in this, in you know by some form of ideology, our colonial education, and so on. And even as we grapple with it now, we cannot come to a certain idea about decolonization, but we know that we have to be on that train. There's just no getting away, as you said. This, uh, you know, it's going to happen with us or without us. Um, the train is certainly moving. So, of course, it's going to require great shifts on our path. It means that we're going to have to read more. And certainly, we're going to read your books, uh, CK, <laughs> and, and the work that you've done. Yeah. Because, as you can see, we are eager to decolonize maths and science. Uh, we might and have the history and philosophy yes, of science, yes. Uh, yes we we might have come in a little bit resistant but uh, we have been convinced in some way or the other and i can tell you that unlike uh, the other universities in south africa where you've spoken and you've felt a resistance uh, ukzn has really taken it by the horns uh, we've well, introduced indigenous very good. languages <laughs> very good uh, we have mm -hmm. a teaching and learning office that supports it um, Kesh was one of those who mm -hmm. talked about maybe understand, uh, you know, writing papers on transformation and how one could track it <laughs> and so on. So certainly uh, things have been started and have been making a move. Excellent. And I think uh, that this conversation we've had today just enlightens us further about the possibilities and more important, I think, that you've stressed is the time for talking mm -hmm. is over. Mm -hmm. Let's add and now and let's get knee deep <laughs> into the water yes, and mm -hmm. wash the clothes clean mm -hmm. and, and get and it right. Dirty, we wash them again. Yes, <laughs> yes. And there's always a chance to mm -hmm. rethink. Absolutely. I think it must mm -hmm. become part of our modus operandi absolutely, absolutely. that absolutely. we don't stick to one thing or the other. So That's thank you very much for thank that enlightening much. conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And certainly we look forward, I will certainly be present at your keynote address to get many more ideas. And Kesh, I'll see you around. <laughs> well, I'll be chairing the keynote. Oh, you'll be chairing. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. So the That's good. Will be there again. <laughs> so you've got some pre insights <laughs> yes. about it. Yes, yes, yes. 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 yes.
So yeah, this is a great place to be. And I, I think I'm excited and energized again. Others, you can get into a rut. When yeah. you have to start with something new, a new project. Mm -hmm. So well, I think that in that respect, South Africa, you woke up quite early. In <laughs> India, it took a long time to wake up. It was only in the 90s that was almost uh, 40 years, uh, well, more than 40 years after independence that we started a uh, project on history and philosophy of science and started this said we should tell our own stories. Why are we listening to all these stories told about us? And uh, that took such a long time. So I think here, because it's very clear, you know, the, uh, the inequality is manifest. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. so people are protesting. That is very important. No? I think you're doing very well, except that you must take into account all the prior experience. You know? That mm -hmm. would be very helpful. Yeah. Certainly, we will not reinvent the wheel. We don't have to. We we'll we'll just steal it. your we idea and present it, it as our own. It. Sure, sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Most welcome. Yeah.